All right, so it's close to 11 and I think we can get started. All right, so I think there's something wrong with my uh, iPad's time. It's showing a, a different date and the time in here. Um, but um, um, so there's, let me see. One thing that's about the, the due date for the homework two and lab reports, as you know, um, because of the weather condition. Uh, so I decided uh, after the discussion with the TA, so I, we decided that it's better that we postpone the deadline for one week. So I hope that during this time, you have more, a little bit more time to work on the homework and the lab report. And we were hoping that this will probably also remove some of the burden for the presentations, especially for the groups this afternoon. Okay. So, um, well, um, so because of that, the, the due dates are postponed by one week. And uh, unfortunately, you're going to have new homework starting from this week. So next time uh, you will bring two homework. So basically homework two and homework three <clears throat> to the class on Wednesday. All right. Um, so let's try to finish up the, um, the basic chemical concepts uh, in this class. Okay, so as you can see, uh, I think from the second class of the uh, of this semester, we started to go over these chemical concepts really quickly, right? So um, I'm not going to spend too much time going over this. So we we'll probably, um, I mean, when we really discuss the uh, water treatment or wastewater treatment facilities, sometimes we probably need to go back come back and then revisit the concepts again, okay? So for right now, we'll just go over some basic ideas so that you have the impression, uh, know what they mean and uh, how we're going to deal with them, okay? So let's do a quick recap of our last class. So last class, we mainly talk about the, the pH, right? We spent more than half of the time talking about the, uh, the water pH, right? So basically it's a, quantification of the hydrogen ion concentration, right? So we said that the P here is just a operator, right? So the P here means negative log 10, right, of something. So pH just means the negative log 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration, right? So, and also we said that for uh, water systems, right? So the, the water, the dissociation of the water always has a constant, Right, that is Kw equal to the concentration of hydrogen ions multiplied by the concentration of uh, hydroxide ion. This is always a constant that is 10 to the negative 14. Right, so if you know what is the concentration of the hydrogen ions, you will know what is the concentration of the hydroxide ions. So that's that's the basic idea. So we also spend a little bit of time about the uh, the gas liquid uh, equilibria. We specifically talk about, talked about the Henry's constant or Henry's law, right? So what that means is that um, there's also going to be a equilibrium setting up between the liquid and the gas, right? So, so for some of the gas species um, or for any gas species, right? No matter whether it's carbon dioxide or oxygen, nitrogen, they all try to dissolve into water, right? But what the Henry's law means is that there's going to be a linear relationship between the, <clears throat> between the partial pressure and the concentration of this gas species in the water, right? So this uh, linear relationship is um, regulated by this constant, which is Henry's constant in this solution, not in this equation here. Okay, so the higher the partial pressure, the larger the concentration of the gas species, right? So this is how we can apply this Henry's constant or Henry's law into this gas liquid uh, equilibrium. So now I'll, I'll launch a quiz here, okay? So uh, for those who, who join the class, I think you're going to get a bonus in this class now, all right? So um, this is the first question. So what does it mean by pH equals to zero? Okay, I think we also discussed this in our last class. So what does it mean to the, P, uh, the hydrogen ion concentration? So I'm going to give you half a minute.
Okay, 10 more seconds. <clears throat> All right, we'll stop here, okay? Uh, so most of you are correct, right? So it just means that the hydrogen ion concentration is one M, which is one mole per liter, right? So pH equals to zero, it means that the, the, the solution here is very acidic, right? It has a very high concentration of the hydrogen ions. So similarly, if you have, if you know what is the, the hydrogen ion concentration, right? 1m, that is one mole per liter. You can also calculate what is the hydroxide ion concentration, right? Just by using this relationship here. So you can see that the hydroxide ion concentration is going to be 10 to the negative 14m. Okay, so this is how we use the uh, acid base equilibrium. Right? So we'll probably just uh, talk a little bit more about the, the gas liquid equilibrium, right? So last class, we showed this curve. We said that this curve is called the Keeling curve, which is uh, a direct evidence of how the human activity is affecting the um, atmospheric um, composition, right? You see that just within th 60 years, we increased carbon dioxide by more than a third. So um, as we know, the carbon dioxide is mainly coming from the fossil fuel combustion. Right? There's no other natural processes that's emitting carbon dioxide. Maybe volcano activities, but there are just so few volcanoes or active volcanoes on our world right now. And the release rate is much less than the, um, let's say when we burn the coal or we burn the uh, gasoline, right? So it's mainly um, due to the human activity that's causing this um, rapid increase of the carbon dioxide concentration. So we said that um, this rapid increase is also partly because the carbon dioxide has a, a relatively low um, um, uh, Henry's constant, right? We said that if the Henry's constant is high, then this higher partial pressure can get converted into the concentration. It means that the ocean can absorb more of the carbon dioxide. But unfortunately, this value is too small here, which means that uh, most of the carbon dioxide is still going to float in the atmosphere and cause this uh, uh, greenhouse gas effect, right? So we said that the carbon dioxide is a, is a very important species in our, um, in our environment. And this is not only because in the atmosphere. So <clears throat> in water, the carbon dioxide also acts uh, or form the buffer system. Uh, I don't think you have gone through the lab session on, on buffer yet, but later on uh, you will uh, have some experiments on that. So what a buffer means is that, <clears throat> so a buffer is basically a solution that can resist a large change in the pH, right? When you add acid or base into the, into the solution. For example, we're dumping a lot of wastewater into the uh, natural system, right? So we know that the, the battery acid, it has a pH of one and then some like bleach or or, or drain cleaner, right? It has the pH of 14, so which is very basic. You have very acidic and very basic uh, wastewater. So if you just dump them into pure water, right? Doesn't have any, um, doesn't have any other ions, then there's going also going to be a very large change in the pH. So a simple example can be, let's say we, we put um, some um, hydrogen chloride or hydrochlorous acid into pure water. Okay, so for example, it was asking, what will it be the pH of water or the solution if you add uh, hydrochloric acid to 0.1 mole per liter? Okay, so a simple calculation can be, because we know that the hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. So what that means is that all of these 0.1 mole per liter of the um, compound is going to get dissociated. So basically we're going to have a hydrogen ion concentration to be 0.1 m, right? Similarly, chloride ion concentration will be 0.1 m too. So if you know what is the hydrogen ion concentration, right? So basically, um, so basically you can plug in the calculation of the pH, right? That is negative log 10 of 0.1, right? So it means that the pH is just one. So it means that basically this 
acid here or this wastewater here is going to be very acidic, right? Just because we added in a little bit amount of the uh, uh, hydrochloric acid. So uh, also what this means is that when you add these uh, acid into pure water, um, so you're going to generate a lot of excess hydrogen ions. And these excess hydrogen ions are going to um, give you a lower pH, basically pollute the wastewater, all right? So now let's consider a situation, right? We know that there are carbon dioxide floating in the air, right? There are a lot of minerals, right? Like when we discuss the limestone, right? Limestone can get dissolved into the water and give you some of the carbonate ion species, right? So let's imagine what if you, instead of using pure water, what if you, you have a solution that contains 0.1 M of the uh, sodium carbonate? Okay, and now you add in 0.1 M of the hydrochloric acid. Okay, so we know that what's going to happen is these hydrogen ions are going to react with the carbonate ions, right? And then they're going to form bicarbonate ions, right? So basically, if you have a solution that's composed of this salt here, this carbon ion here, you're not going to generate these excess hydrogen ions anymore. And as a matter of fact, the bicarbonate ion is just a very weak acid, right? It's going to just release a tiny amount of the hydrogen ions there. So instead of releasing all of these um, hydrogen ions into the water, right? You're just releasing a, a very small fraction. So there isn't going to be a very large change in the pH, okay? So the pH is not going to reach all the way to one, right? Um, actually, it's just going to stay close to seven or eight, okay? So um, this carbon ion is, is so helpful that even if you double the amount of the HCl, if you double the amount of the hydrochloric acid, it's still not going to give you a pH of one. That's because uh, after you have the bicarbon ion, and if you add 0.1 M more of the hydrochloric acid, right? So instead of putting in 0.1 M, let's put in 0.2 M. So we know that this extra 0.1 M is going to react with the bicarbonate ion to form carbonic acid, right? Again, the carbonic acid is a very weak acid, right? This is weak. So by saying that this is a weak acid, it means that it's still not going to release a lot of these excess hydrogen ions, okay? So basically it's still being attached onto, onto these compounds. And so in this way, it's, it's still not going to give you a very low pH here. So that's how the buffer works, right? So just by adding some of the <clears throat> carbonate, uh, carbonate species into the water, you can resist a very large change in the pH, okay? So that's why uh, our ecosystem can actually have these uh, self-healing process, right? By having these carbonate ions, right? Even if we dump a tiny bit amount of the, uh, let's say very high pH water or very low pH waste water, it's still not going to cause some disaster, right? To the, uh, to the animals or, or living, uh, living beings in the, in the water, okay? So this is what the buffer means. And now uh, next is a, a concept you probably already used in your lab one, okay? So that is the alkalinity. So the, you can see that the alkalinity uh, basically uh, it's related to the word alkane, right? So alkane is very basic, okay? So the al alkalinity just means how much alkane it contains in the solution, or more specifically, it is the acid neutralizing capability. So basically how much hydrogen ions it can react with, right? The higher the alkalinity, it means that it can react with more hydrogen ions, okay? So that's why when you calculate alkalinity, it's just the concentration or the molar concentration of the hydrogen ions. So um, for example, since we talk about the uh, carbon carbonate species, right? And it's also the most common um, species that's existing in the water. So if we assume that water only contains these carbonate species, then the alkalinity can be calculated in this way, okay? So that is the molar concentration or the molarity of the bicarbonate ions plus twice of the molarity of the uh, carbonate ions plus the OH ions, hydroxide ions, and minus the hydrogen ion concentration. 
okay, so why is it, right? So <clears throat> basically the alkalinity means how much of hydrogen you can react with. You know that the bicarbonate ion can react with one. So basically one bicarbonate ion can react with one hydrogen ion, ion due to this reaction here, right? So once they form these uh, um, uh, carbonic acid, it's never going to receive more hydrogen ions, right? It's not going to react with more hydrogen ions. So that's why they have a one-to-one -one ratio. But for the carbonate ion, they are able to react with two hydrogen ions because you can see that first, this reaction can take one hydrogen ion to form bicarbonate. And then the second reaction can take one more hydrogen ion. So that's why you multiply the molarity of the uh, uh, the carbonyl ion by two. Basically, they can react with two number of the hydrogen ions, right? You also need to consider the hydroxide ion. You know, hydroxide can react with uh, hydrogen ions with, with one to one ratio. And furthermore, you need to minus the existing hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, so basically, this is the equation. And we also need to pay attention that we need to use molarity here. or mole per liter, oops, or the mole per liter, right? Because if you use, just use the mass concentration, we know that the hydroxide ion is lighter, right? It has a molecular weight of 17, right? Gram per mole. And for this one, the bicarbonate ion has a, um, a molecular weight of 61, right? Gram per mole. So if you directly use their mass concentration, it's not going to work. Right, because for the same mass, there's going to be more uh, hydroxide ion that can react with more hydrogen ions, right? So that's why you have to convert all of these into molarity first, mole per liter first, okay? So in terms of the unit for the alkalinity, this ALK here, as we said, we should use mole per liter. So sometimes people also use equivalent per liter. So basically the equivalent per liter is just the same as mole per liter. So it's talking about this concentration equivalent, equivalent with hydrogen ions, okay? So it's the same. So basically you can either use mole per liter or equivalent per liter. And uh, most of the time, um, when we talk about the like natural water systems, the concentration of these ions will be pretty low. So that's why people also use the millimole per liter. So that's just 1000 times of the millimole. So one mole per liter is 1000 times of millimole. And similarly, you could have 1,000 milli equivalent per liter. Okay, this is this is their their units. Um, so then we'll have a question. So what is the alkalinity of pure water? Okay, just based on this concept here. So I'm going to launch the second quiz. All right. So just based on this equation, what is the alkalinity of pure water? So please pay attention that alkalinity is not pH, okay? So 10 more seconds. All right, we'll stop here. So the correct answer should be zero, okay? So as we said, the pH um, of uh, pure water is seven. Okay, the alkalinity is something different. Alkalinity is how much hydrogen ions it can react with. Okay, so just based on this equation here, um, we know that pure water doesn't have any bicarbonate ions or carbonate ions. It just contain a hydroxide ion, the OH ion and the hydrogen ions. And also the, for pure water, the ion concentration to be, should be the same because 
the water is neutral, right? So both of them are 10 to the negative seven M, okay? So because of that, if you plug in the numbers, then the alkalinity should be zero, okay? So that's why the second answer is correct. Um, yeah, so this is the concept of the alkalinity. Maybe I can just relaunch the quiz because uh, I just want to confirm that most of you are following me in the class. <clears throat> so five more seconds. Okay, we'll stop here. All right, so most, uh, I think this time the result looks much better, all right? So basically there's difference between these uh, two concepts here. And I think in lab one, you actually use the idea of the alkalinity, right? You measure the alkalinity of a solution, all right? So um, <clears throat> this is about the alkalinity and uh, um, actually for pure water, this is very simple case, right? We just assume that <clears throat> there's no uh, bicarbonate ions or carbon ions, right? But um, in actual situation, this alkalinity can get a little bit more complicated, right? For example, if we have a solution that has 100 milligram per liter of the carbon ions, 75 milligram per liter of the bicarbon ions, and we know the pH equals to 10, uh, it wants us to calculate what is the alkalinity, okay? So uh, basically to do this, we just need to list all the equation, right? We know that ALK is just the molarity of the bicarbon ion plus twice of the molarity of the carbon ions, right? Plus OH ion minus the hydrogen ion, right? So uh, one thing we said that um, to plug in the numbers, we shouldn't use the mass concentration. We should use the molar concentration instead, right? So how do we convert this, uh, how do we convert this mass concentration into molar concentration? So what, they, what we should do is to just divide these uh, mass into uh, by their molecular weight, right? So basically if you have the bicarbonate ion concentration, then it's just going to be 75 multiplied by 10 to the third gram per liter, right? And then you divide it by their molecular weight. So for this bicarbonate the molecular weight is, molecular weight is one plus 12 plus three multiplied by 16, that's going to be what? Uh, 61, right? 61 gram per mole. So you divide that by 61 gram per mole. So also if you check the unit here, right? The gram and gram will get canceled out. You're going to just get mole per liter, right? This is what we want. You need to convert it into molarity. And then for the second one, it's just a hundred multiply by 10 to the third, 10 to the minus three gram per liter. And then divide that by the molecular weight. So here the molecular weight will be 60 gram per mole. Right, and then we'll further add in the, <clears throat> the molarity of the hydroxide ion and the hydrogen ions, okay? So how do we get that? We need to use the pH, right? So if you know the pH equals to 10, then what it means is that the hydrogen ion concentration is just 10 to the minus 10 M, okay? Or mole per liter, right? So it's negative log 10, right? Further, we know that for a water constant, Kw, that's equal to 10 to the negative 14, which is hydrogen ion concentration multiplied by the OH ion concentration, and then you will get that the OH ion concentration will be 10 to the minus 14 divided by 10 to the minus 10. That's going to be 10 to the minus four mole per liter. Okay, so this is how we can use this, uh, uh, how we can use this pH to, to get the concentration of 
all of these ions, okay? Another way to calculate the, the OH ion concentration is, we know that pH plus pOH equals to 14, right? So if you know the pH, then pOH equals to four. So you can also get, so based on the, the calculation of the P, right, negative log 10, and the OH ion concentration is 10 to the negative four mole per liter. All right, this is different ways to calculate this uh, ion concentrations here. So basically with these con conditions, right, we can plug it in 10 to the negative four mole per liter. And then we'll minus the concentration of the hydrogen ions, which is 10 to the minus 10 mole per liter. Right, so these are all the numbers that we should plug in. All right, so uh, basically, um, so basically, uh, you can you can use a calculator to to just plug everything in. I saw that Logan actually posted here. It's molar mass, right? So uh, I, I'm just using these uh, terms interchangeably. So. Um, theoretically, it should be molar mass instead of molecular weight, okay? So uh, when I say molecular weight, well, uh, what I really mean is here is uh, this value here having the unit of gram per mole here, okay? So, but thanks for mentioning this up. All right, so basically we can use these calculations to um, derive these numbers. And then uh, this is what we are going to have, right? So, um, and moreover, uh, basically we see here that all of the units here are mole per liter, right? So uh, we can change it into millimole per liter or milli equivalent per liter, right? So what we need to do is that we just need to multiply 1000, right? So that we can get the unit of millimole per liter or milli equivalent per liter. Right, so um, this is how we can plug in everything inside, right? So the final answer is 4.66 milli equivalent per liter, all right? So, um, so basically, if you have the um, uh, alkal uh, alkalinity in 4.66, right, milli equivalent per liter. So actually by convention, uh, people also use the unit of milligram as calcium carbonate, okay? So um, milligram uh, per liter as calcium carbonate is kind of like an equivalent unit, okay? So um, the way you can think about this is we calculated the alkalinity of this solution here, okay? So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to find a solution that contains calcium carbonate only that has the same alkalinity as this solution, okay? So the reason behind that is um, calcium carbonate is, is basically limestone, right? So as we introduced earlier, uh, so by using this equivalent mass, it's easier to design uh, different types of engineering uh, facilities, right? So you can directly get an understanding of what it means by raw material, right? How much raw material uh, we should buy uh, to treat the water quality, right? So to convert the unit into a uh, uh, milligram per liter as calcium carbonate, uh, it's very simple. You just need to multiply this thing by 50, okay? So um, if you multiply 4.66 by 50, that's going to be 233 milligram per liter as calcium carbonate, okay? So if the problem wants you to answer the alkalinity in, in this unit here, uh, what you do is you just multiply that by 50, okay? So then uh, you may ask why, why that's 50, right? Why not 100 or, or just five, right? So a simple way of thinking about this is, uh, since we're trying to find the equivalent as calcium carbonate, right? We need to know that um, the criteria is that this calcium carbonate solution need to have the same alkalinity. So we first, what we can do is that we can treat this solution as if it's just made of calcium carbonate, okay? So uh, let's say that we prepare a solution that contains one mole per liter, one M of calcium carbonate, right? 
we know that the alkalinity is the acid neutralizing capability, or more specifically, how much uh, hydrogen ions they can react with, right? We know that the calcium carbonate can react with two number of the uh, hydrogen. That's because calcium carbonate can do this, right? To form carbonic acid plus calcium ion. Right. So basically, one m of the calcium carbonate can react with two m of the uh, hydrogen ions. Okay. So what that means is that for this solution here, its alkalinity is just going to be two m, two mol per liter, right? Because it can react with two mol per liter of uh, hydrogen ions, right? Based on the uh, definition here, right? Definition is how much hydrogen ions it can react with. So that's going to be two mole per liter, which means that the alkalinity is two equivalent per liter. So we can also do a conversion. Let's multiply uh, 0 0.001 on both sides. So which means that if you have one millimole, uh, one milliamp of the calcium carbonate in solution, then its alkalinity is just two milli equivalent per liter. Okay. So then. Uh, you could say that, you could see that if we have a solution that has an alkalinity of one milli equivalent per liter, right? Let's just look at half of it. We take uh, divide both sides by two, right? Right. If you have one milli equivalent per liter, it just means that in terms of calcium carbonate concentration, that's 0.5 milli m, right? So 0.5 millimole per liter. And if we multiply that by the the molar weight of the calcium carbonate. Right, that's 1,000 gram per mole. Right, if you multiply this into here, right, you're going to have 50 milligram of the calcium carbonate per liter. Right. So basically, for alkalinity, what you can see is that one milli equivalent per liter is just 50 milligram of calcium carbonate per liter. So that's why you have this uh, 50 times uh, ratio here. Right. So if you know. Uh, what is the alkalinity in milli equivalent or millimole uh, per liter, right? You can just multiply that by 50 to get the alkalinity in equivalent of the calcium carbonate. Okay, that's 233 milligram per liter as calcium carbonate. All right, so this is about the alkalinity, right? So uh, we said that the calcium carbon, the, the, the carbon dioxide system is very important. Um, also for the uh, the water systems, right? The um, buffer system or the alkalinity is definitely one of them. But actually, we know that there are so much of the carbon dioxide that they can also get dissolved into the rain droplets, right? So there's a very interesting question about what is going to be the pH of the rainwater. So we can use our knowledge until now to actually calculate what is the rainwater uh, pH. And uh, we know that the rainwater is going to be a little bit acidic, right? because carbon dioxide can get dissolved to form carbonic acid, and carbonic acid is going to release some hydrogen ions. It's going to be acidic, but it's not uh, acid um, enough that it, it's going to corrode the, um, let's say the constructions, right? The bridges or the, the, the buildings. Because um, for a lot of these bridges and buildings, right? You need to have more acidic species. And that's why we worry about the uh, acid rain, right? So the, uh, the, the rainwater is still not acid uh, enough to corrode those species. But we can do this calculation by just combining the Henry's law and the, um, the, uh, the uh, equilibrium uh, constant, right? So we know that the Henry's law basically uh, describes what's the concentration of the carbon dioxide um, as a function of the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide. Right, so it turns out that in our atmosphere, if we assume that the carbon dioxide concentration is just, or the mixing ratio is 295 ppm, we know that, uh, I mean, this number is probably probably 10 years ago. We know that just a few months ago, it already reached to 420 ppm, right? So if we just assume that the carbon dioxide mixing ratio is 295, then its partial pressure can be calculated to be 10 to the negative 3.53 atm. So you can plug that in, right? So to just plug in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and then also plug in the Henry's constant. 
So you can find the concentration of carbon dioxide in water that is 10 to the negative five mole per liter, right? Carbon dioxide, once they get dissolved, they're just forming these carbonic acid, okay? So this is a compound. It's automatically going to uh, form this uh, carbonic acid compound here. And then we know that the carbonic acid is a uh, weak acid, right? It's going to get dissolved into the hydrogen ion, bicarbonate ion. It has a uh, equilibrium constant of 10 to the negative 6.34, uh, 6.35. What it simply means is that the Ka1 is just the concentration of the hydrogen ion multiplied by the concentration of bicarbonate ion divided by the concentration of the carbonic acid, okay? So similarly, um, this bicarbonate ion can further get dissolved into hydrogen ion and uh, carbonate ion, okay? It's also going to have a another, actually another equilibrium rate constant. But let's just look at this um, equation for now, okay? For example, we can just ignore this second step for now, right? So what we can do is uh, we can start to plug in the numbers Right, this is 10 to the negative 6.35, right, Ka1. And further, we know that the carbonic acid concentration is 10 to the negative five, right? This is what we already get from the Henry's law. So we're quite kind of close to the um, solving the hydrogen ion concentration and further the pH, right? So now we can assume that, I mean, based on this equation, you can see that there's a one-to-one -one ratio between the hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. So let's just assume that the hydrogen ion concentration is the same as the bicarbonate ion concentration, okay? So with this assumption, we can see that basically we have 10 to the negative 6.35 equals to hydrogen ion concentration to the power two divided by 10 to the negative five, okay? So the hydrogen ion concentration to the power two is going to be 10 to 11.35. Okay, so further we can take the square root. Okay, so you can calculate out that uh, basically this is what we had here, right? This is in the solution, right? So the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the negative 5.7. Okay, so what is the pH? The pH is just 5.7 because pH again is negative log 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, so clearly the pH is less than seven, right? We said that if it's less than seven, it's acidic, right? So that's why the, the rain droplet are acidic because the carbon dioxide is getting, is getting dissolved, right? And then you may have the question, well, here, as you can see, when we solve the problem, we were assuming that there's a one-to-one -one ratio here, but wouldn't the bicarbonate ion further get dissolved into hydrogen ions and uh, carbonate ions, right? So theoretically, if these ones are going to react, right, then theoretically, this thing should be higher than this thing, right? Because we're consuming the bicarbonate ion to form more hydrogen ions. But it turns out that, um, here, what I'm showing is the phase diagram of the, um, you know, the carbonate species, okay? So um, although we have three different types of carbonate species, right? So you, you can have the uh, carbonic acid, the bicarbonate ions, or the carbonate ions. So there's no circumstance that all of these are going to coexist together, okay? So under each pH, only two of them can exist, okay? So for example, in the more acidic range, right? If the pH is less than seven, you can see that only the carbonic acid and bicarbonate ions can be there, which is the case <clears throat> for this ring droplet, right? You see that when pH is equal to 5.7, right? This is acidic range, right? There's no way that we can form these, uh, these carbon ions. So that's why this assumption that we made here the hydrogen ion concentration equals to bicarbonate ion concentration is correct, okay? So uh, basically this is, a, this is under the more acidic condition. If it's going to the basic condition, then the 
the carbonic acid cannot be there, right? It's only the bicarbonate ions and the carbonate ions. Okay, so um, basically this is how these three different species can coexist or can, can exist in the water systems. And uh, generally in the acidic, acidic condition, it's only these two, right? In the basic condition, it's only these two. And based on these, uh, this phase diagram here, uh, you can see that, um, um, I mean, in the, in the rainwater, you're going to have a lower pH, okay? So this is the um, uh, last thing about the chemical equilibrium, right? This is an example of how we can use these concepts to, to calculate the pH or analyze some natural systems. <clears throat> so finally, we want to talk about the, um, the reaction kinetics or the chemical kinetics. Okay, so um, we spend a lot of time talking about the equilibrium. So what does the equilibrium mean? It means the final state, right? And the final state, let's say the species uh, reacting into the other species is going to have the same rate as the products going back to the reactants, right? So it's the final state. Let's say the state going from A to B. But it's not, never telling us how fast this uh, this reaction is, right? How fast we're going to reach to equilibrium. For example, for our, un uh, for our universe, right? At least in our lifetime, it's never going to reach, reach to equilibrium because what equilibrium means is that uh, basically all of the suns, right? The, 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 the reactions, right? The, the radioactive materials are going to release their energy, right? That's going to be the final state of the universe. That's the equilibrium, right? So it's going to take a long time, right? Very long time. But there are also processes that just needs a very short time to reach the equilibrium. Let's say uh, we just burn the charcoal, right? Just burn the candle. It's not going to take a very long time for it to just uh, get combusted and then just leave some ash in there, right? So because of that, um, we cannot just use the equilibrium to deal with the uh, water treatment, right? Because if you put some organic um, pollutant in the water, I mean, eventually, right, thousands of years later, then all of those organics are going to get oxidized just by the air in our Earth. But the thing is that we can't wait for that long to deal with the pollutants. So that's why we also need to know about the chemical kinetics basically how fast these uh, chemicals can react, right? Uh, again, going back to this organic oxidation. So uh, if we're trying to deal with some organic pollutants in the wastewater, if the oxidation is very fast, then we can design a smaller reactor, right? We can put in a large flow rate of the wastewater because we know that the reaction is very fast. But if the reaction is very slow, then we need to build a very large reactor so that it can stay longer in there, right? And, and uh, they can get more, uh, uh, I mean, more of the reactants can, can get converted. So uh, regarding the reaction kinetics, the only thing we need to know is about the orders of the reactions, okay? So there can be zeros order, first order, second order uh, type of reactions. Of course, there are higher order reactions. So basically what these orders mean is just, um, uh, what about, uh, it's just about uh, certain types of uh, reaction rates, okay? So for example, the first order, uh, the zeros order reaction, what that means is that the reaction rate or the losing rate of the reactant is just a constant. It's not dependent on anything else, okay? So for example, this reactant is getting converted into B. We can write out the, the reaction rate, right? So DC divided by DT, let's say, need to put in A here, okay? So the concentration of A, uh, because we know that the reaction is consuming A, so the concentration of A is always decreasing. So DCA divided by DT, that's going to be negative, right? That's why we put a negative sign in here to show that this is a reaction rate. The rate is always a positive, and that's equal to a constant, okay? So this is what uh, the zeros order reaction mean. So we can easily integrate this function, right? Because on the right hand, if, the right hand side, if it's a constant, it just means that if you integrate it, right? So it just means that CA equal to C zero minus KT, 
right? It's going to decrease with time linearly, right? This also means that after a certain time, right? After we reach to this time here, uh, the concentration of the reactant is just zero, okay? So uh, this is zero's order. So there's also first order reaction. I have to say that the first order reaction is the most important type of reaction in our class, okay? So the first order reaction just means that the reaction rate is uh, proportional to the concentration of the reactant, okay? Again, let's put in A here. So DCA, DT, if we put the negative sign here to show the rate, then it's proportional to the concentration of the species A. And this indeed makes sense, right? Let's say that if we try to uh, react some molecules, and then the reaction rate at the beginning is going to be the highest because there are more of these molecules, right? And the reaction rate, let's say, after a very long time is going to be very slow because there are just fewer of these reactants here, okay? So this type of reaction right here can capture that uh, process, okay? So for this reaction, um, we can also do a simple integration here. So basically you can move the CA to the left-hand side equals, equals to minus KT, KDT. Uh, if you just move the DT to the right-hand side, it's CA to the left-hand side. And then under this situation, if you do the integration, we know that the DCA divided by CA, if you integrate that, that's going to be log, right? And on the right-hand side, you have minus KT plus a constant. So now if you take the exponential on both sides, you're going to have uh, this concentration profile, okay? So if you plot the concentration as a function of time, Right, its concentration is going to decay uh, exponentially. So that's why we say that the concentration change or decrease exponentially. Uh, this uh, basically means that it's a first order reaction, okay? So this is quite important when we try to uh, analyze the water quality. So for example, if you have a river, right? Let's say the Mississippi River, let me draw it from the north to south, right? And then let's say this is St. Louis, right? <clears throat> so we know that upstream in the, the river, there are a lot of farmlands and people might use the organic uh, fertilizers, right? So these organic fertilizers, they can infiltrate through the soil and then get accumulated in the water. And for example, if we want to build a water treatment plant in St. Louis, right? We need to make sure that the, the pollutant concentration is low, okay? Um, so under that situation, we have to use this, um, this reaction right here, right? For example, if we want to confirm that the concentration in here is just 10% of the concentration in here, okay? So let's say the concentration in here is C8, right, C0, and the concentration in here, we want to make sure that it's just one-tenth of the initial concentration, then we should plug it in, right, to, to see how long it takes to reach to that state. Point. 0.1 C0 equal to C0 exponential minus KT, right? So basically you can solve this, you can solve this equation to find how long of a time it, it uh, requires to decay to that uh, one tenth of the concentration. And further, if you know the flow rate or the, the speed of the river, right? Let's say that if it flows by one kilometer per day, Right. And further, if you know that the time is 20 days, it simply means that when we treat the water, we have to take the water 20 kilometers downstream of the river, right? Because it's flowing at this speed and then it's taking 20 days for the organic components to decay, right? So there's also second order reactions. What that means is that the reaction rate is just proportional to the concentration to the power two. So you can see that the zeroth order, first order, second order just means what's the power shown in this reactant here, right? So theoretically, this should be CA to the power of zero, which is just one in there, right? So finally, it's the, the rate constant. So the rate constant, uh, basically it's just this K here, but the K value also change with temperature. So a simple way to calculate the K value under different temperatures use this equation. For example, people normally measure the K value at 25 Celsius. 
if they are curious about what's the uh, K and value under 30 Celsius, then they can just use this equation here, plug in the rate constant here, right? The T1 is going to be 25 Celsius. And let's say if it's 30 Celsius, then we can plug it in here, right? You basically just get K1 theta to the power of five. And for different reactions, they can have different values for theta. It's either 1.072 or 1.035, okay? So this is the rate constant. So finally, it's a review of all the contents that we went over for the previous four classes. Um, maybe you can use the time off the class to see, right? We just basically went through some uh, fundamental concepts on chemistry and then let's say equilibrium, uh, alkalinity, reaction, rate constants, and so on, okay? So I will put the new homework um, posted on Canvas. And for the lab this afternoon, I'll be there for the first, let's say few minutes to make sure that there are uh, no technical issues. And then um, uh, I'll also be there tomorrow, okay? For the Thursday sessions, I'll also try to be there. Um, so feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I know that the class online, maybe it's a little bit difficult to comprehend everything, but uh, this lecture is also recorded. So I'll uh, send you the link later on, all right? So you all have a good day.